Hi, this is Justin. Justin Spring, for those of you who haven't been here before. Uh, this is, I think, the 10th installment of the Psychic Roots of Poetry. And uh, what I thought I'd do today is, is take one of those Einsteinian journeys again. You know, I've been mentioning in the past couple of sessions that Einstein would, uh, was a very imaginative person. You people think of him as a great mathematician. He wasn't really that great. He needed help in mathematics, but conceptually he was beyond all the number crunchers. And he used to take these journeys on a broomstick. He would imagine himself with all of his knowledge of matter and light, and he would imagine himself sitting on the broomstick, and right next to him was a shaft of light. You're going at the speed of light, you know, which we know is the fastest possible thing, at least according to the your current theories. And he would imagine what would happen as he approached the speed of light, maybe even exceeded it, and just let his mind float to, to see what would happen to him and to the broomstick and to the light itself. That's not a real situation. That's a uh, That's a highly theoretical situation and it's highly stylized because there's more than just a shaft of light and Albert and a broomstick in the world, you know. But it's one of those simplified things that, uh, that in fact eventually allows you to see things. And I suggested we could take a trip back to the beginning of the human race to the point where two animals came together, I hope a lot more successfully than that, you know, and they produced a human had to happen at some stage, whether it happened very, very quickly or whether it happened over a period of uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of years, that particular the genesis is hard to say. Um, my own feeling about it, and it's just intuitive, is that it happened very quickly. As we're finding out that what scientists uh, thought was the... Um, very gradual change of mice to something bigger to something bigger to something bigger that, that there are so many gaps in the theory in terms of the uh, change points uh, that they found in in some recent studies that the change could happen like that and then maybe some gradual changes within the species but the but the jump from uh, from uh, when, when you have an extraordinary jump that, that it can happen extremely quickly. So there's nothing more extraordinary than, than an animal becoming human. It's only happened once. It happened to, in the your primates. Uh, I think our ancestors were much, much smarter than the chimpanzees we're supposed to have descended from or that we're very close to. We may be close to them in the chain of whatever it is, but I think that the... Your primates, those little bones they're finding, the little Lucy's and everything, you know, back in time, and that's the first humans or proto-humans or, you know, all of the rest of it. Um, that, that I think that your transition happened extremely quickly, and, and what happened is that we went from an animal who lives solely in the present, solely in the present, has memory, has problem-solving, I mean, scientists know that now, but you know, people who have lived with animals, you know, and who have trained animals know they have memory, and then they know they have problem solving, and they know for sure they have emotions. You ask any elephant trainer who's been trampled. Uh, I just saw something on the TV about that, about the Indian elephant trainers, and uh, that the that there's some stage that, in fact, the elephant will, will you get on to them if they've been mistreated to their mahout, and they'll do a job on him. It's vicious. It's not just a, an expression of rage. It's they're going to get this guy, and they get him good, you know. So um, and they're mean about it too. So it really changes your feelings about what animals are all about, you know. And and I can tell you that that, that they um, have emotions. Uh, they have anger. They have love. They they get goofy, you know, <laughs> just like us, you know. And uh, they're happy, and they're in a state of well-being, and and they can solve problems like the Dickens, and they have memories too. Maybe not memories like ours, but they're pretty good. They remember where the water was. You bet your sweets they do, you know. 
what direction it was in and, and then all the rest of it. And they remember the bed mahouts too. So <clears throat> my own suspicion is that the animals that these two that you changed into us, this theoretical situation, there's two your primates, they come together, mate, and out of that by the scientists like to say accident, which <laughs> some accident, right? It's only happened once, and, and it happened here, and right in my thumb, and our opposable thumb, as we like to say, is the mark of the human. But in fact, the mark of the human is the fact that they are story creators. I call them storytellers, but they're story makers, story creators. They, they change from, from animals that live solely in the present to animals that could stop time for a second, could stop the flow, whatever that is, and they could create a little world out of memories and their perceptions and emotions and present it up to you. It's called a story. It's a little world, not as big as the big world. <laughs> oh, no, even Shakespeare's, you know, it's very small, just a little small story, but it has all the elements in it. We are, we are world creators. They're just a little smaller than the one that we live in. And that humbles all artists, by the way, when they <laughs> think of holding up a mirror to the world, as Shakespeare said, you know, it's a pretty small mirror. But still, we're the only animals that can do that, and the only animals who ever did that, who have ever done it. And I don't mean that you have to tell stories like John Updike. You could just build your ant dune a little bit differently every time, you know. Make it a little square, and then make it round, and then make it rectangular, you know. Make it drippy. That's a story, you know. That's not instinctual behavior. That's human behavior. So anyway, to get back to our little theoretical situation, we're going to bring the two animals together. They're going to mate successfully, and they have a human animal. Will the parents know that this animal is different? No, they'll have no idea, except the animal, the human animal, will sometimes behave a little strangely. Because what that animal is trying to do doesn't know it's trying to do it, but there's some yearning inside that animal to make that little world. That is the mystery of mysteries, how we went from living in the present to be able to stop time, pull out of memory, create a world, and present it to others. That's, that's the Big Bang, you know, because out of that comes E equals MC squared, which is one of the stories we've just created recently, you know. But there are lots of others, too, in the beginning, da 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 da, -da in every culture that there is. So if we take that as a given that, that there are two animals come together, not of that as a human, the human doesn't know he's human. He doesn't know what it feels like to be human. He only knows what it feels like to be him or her, depending on whether it's a male or female animal. The mother and father have no idea. He looks exactly like them. He's not any smarter than his animal brothers and sisters. They're very smart to start with, you know. doesn't have any better memory as far as we know. It doesn't have any better range of emotions as far as we know. It wouldn't necessarily have to change. We think those are all in place. But he has this desire or this yearning which he, to do something, to communicate. Let's put it that way. So that on occasion, despite uh, his or her, let's, let's say we don't know as to which was the first, the male or the female, but I'm going to suggest to you that in our little story, it's the female, or it was eventually the female that, that was able to nurture the humanness out of the new humans that, that were produced, which is very, very, very crucial, because for sure, the animal mother, let's say it's this one here, would take care of the little human animal very nicely, but it wouldn't nurture that human animal as a human because the animal doesn't know any stories or the need to tell stories or the desire to tell stories. Only the little human baby does. The little, the little human animal. And, he, and that human animal doesn't know what's going on. It just feels a little weird at times. And one of the things that we can take from the witnesses log myth, which is kind of playing in back of me in terms of an animated form here, uh, is that it, it makes a 
a few opening statements. It says, in the beginning, there was only darkness and us. We were waiting for the sun. We were like moss clinging to the mountainside. When the listeners came, we changed. We became witnesses. It's a very simple opening. I'd, when, when that poem came to me, I knew I was speaking it correctly. I didn't really have any idea as to what it meant, but I knew it was supposed to be spoken that way. But that's one of the mysteries of poetry. You're like on a guide wire, and you know when you're on the guide wire, the golden thread, and you just keep letting it come to you, and you keep speaking it out, and we had it recorded, and that's what's playing in the back here. It's an audiovisual version of it. What that really says to us is, is that, or in fact, what the myth is trying to say to us is that in the beginning we were like moss, and we were in the darkness, and we were in the dark side of the mountain of knowing, and we, we were like clinging to the mountainside of knowing, which means we were almost human, but not quite, and we were waiting for the sun to grow. And then it makes a sudden jump, and it says, when the listeners came, we changed. We became witnesses, or we became story makers. My own sense of it is that those listeners that are detected by the first humans are really the animal unconscious that they paired off from to become human consciousness, and the animal consciousness became the unconscious, and that's the listeners. It's their feelings. It's the thing they're anchored to. And the only thing I know about the listeners is that they're interested in their feelings. That is, the listeners are interested in the feelings of the witnesses. There's a phrase in the myth that says, they hear us when we're dying. They hear us when we're crying in the silence of our minds. And it's not a physical presence. It's something that's unknowable, untouchable. Can't see it, can't feel it, but you can detect a interest. That interest is different than the interest that, that, in fact, an animal might feel and some other animal's interest in them for mating or for killing them, you know. Whatever it happened to be, they know those instinctual interests. But this is a disinterested interest in the sense there's nothing specifically to be gained. It's just interested in the feelings. And that interest is the thing that, that in fact, eventually triggers us becoming storytellers. I can't explain that to you except that that, that the that sense of having something separate from us that that was the first that's the first thing that's non-animal although the first human wouldn't know it that's all that's ever felt is there's an outside interest somewhere it's not its own that seems to be interested in it for its own reasons which are never declared. It just has an interest in, it's aware of us. And that, that, that unconscious, which I've kind of suggested, if I, that in fact eventually became the gods and the god that we have in all of our Eastern and Western traditions, the unknowable creator, is at this stage it's so nascent that it has no name, it has, it's not active in the world, it's simply, it's a listener. It's an awareness that, that is aware that, that we are human, and it gives us a sense of that we're somewhat separate, although that, that in fact the first human wouldn't know it, it would just know, they would feel there's a, a presence somewhere, and that's going to take its own course. Somehow, and in fact the myth never makes clear as to what the trigger between that and between the story making is, but I can give you one suggestion and just leave it at that. If you don't have a listener, you won't make a story. In fact, the easy that in fact the easiest example of that is if you're you're at a party or a cocktail party and you're talking to somebody who, who you think is spellbound, <laughs> which is usually the case with me about what I'm talking about. And then they suddenly turn away for a canopy and walk straight off the floor. Your whole you stop. You're like a toy that's wound down. You're done. Storytelling, which is the whole general thing about conversing, we converse in stories. Well, this is what happened to me, and this is why I'm important. Or they're all stories. You know, you're making up or telling the people. It's really a way of 
conveying our feelings to someone else, some other human being. We think the stories are great, but the story is just a spear carrier to bring the feelings over so that we break out of that isolation. You know, so, so we can do more than just say, simply say I'm angry or I'm happy or pick the nits off me, you know. I think that probably in terms of human evolution, if you want to look at a reason why, is that, that our intelligence and our emotions and our memory were bursting at the seams. We, we had to be able to say more, to communicate more than, than we were capable of as animals. And in some animals, for some reason, that happened, that that happened with us. What that kind of brings you to then is you have a, that's a little aside, but and, and, and you know, someone might say, well, you know, I talk to myself all the time and there's nobody there. Yeah, but you're there because you have a modern consciousness and the modern consciousness is schizophrenic. It creates a you to listen to you bitch and moan about everything. I do it all day long. You know? <laughs> so I'm talking to somebody and I'm all rating and doing this and that and the other person is, oh, yeah, 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 but it's just me. It's just me inside or some other manufactured person that I'm talking to, you know. So there's always a listener, whether it's manufactured by our modern intelligence, our modern consciousness has a way of you know, creating you know, play actors inside us, inside our mind space in which we can communicate with them different versions of ourselves or others and goes on and on forever it just doesn't stop you know uh, but if you don't have somebody listening you can't tell a story the story doesn't want to be created stories are the ways that we communicate and the story that we're essentially concerned with here is a story called poetry which is a special story in that we, we can say there are two kinds of stories. There's the ordinary story where we tell what happened to us today when we crossed the street and we, and we forgot to look to our left or our right. We almost got run over. Oh, my God, you know, I'll never do that again. There's that story we tell everybody for weeks until they're bored to tears. And then there's the, there's the story that just rises up inside us and moves our lips or our hands if we're writing, but if you learn how to speak it, if you let it go, it'll just come right out of you as a poem. It, it, it's a communication from the unconscious to the conscious that brings us together, that really makes us whole again. That's a, that's a, that's a special story, very special. It has the surface, it, it has the aim at bringing us together into one whole again for a moment. And then letting us go back to our conscious, chitty chattery mind and our deep, wavy unconscious going its own way. But they're both us, brother. That's what you have to. And the one underneath us, which we call our unconscious, that goes pretty deep. You can think of the conscious mind as like a surface sheen and it's very brilliant and it reflects the sun and the moon and the skies and the whole universe. But it's nothing, it's just a little sheen on top of beneath it. All strange things are moving, we have no idea that eventually come up and change the surface. The moon's in a different position now, and our faces and looks on it, it's like this, you know? So, <laughs> you, you, gotta, you, you gotta pay attention to these things, you know? It, anyway, let, let me get back to, that, to our first animal, because that's important. Excuse me, let me. Our first human animal doesn't really know what's going on. It knows that once in a while it will erupt with something, and there's no language now, okay? This is our imaginary situation. There's no language. There's just the animal sounds that the animal has inherited as instinctive sound. <laughs> you know, they, they go on. They, they have a little vocabulary. Maybe there's 15 or 20 or 30 sounds that they make for various things, and they're always accompanied by gestures and things like this, you know, da 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 uh, uh, But there's no language. That doesn't stop us from telling stories. Stories can be told through a series of physical gestures, mime, you know, and it can be told uh, 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 through those sounds. You know, they're primal emotions. You can link them together to tell a story. I saw you yesterday and I was angry at you. Just point, you don't have to have you, just point you, you, me, you, you know, like that. So that's a, that's a, that's a story. And I think every once in a while, our first human would would just kind of erupt in those. 
but they were different than just the, just the exclamations of what all animals had done since the beginning of time. They were just expressions in the present. And so what happened? The other animals, including mom and pop, would just look at the, you. Let's say that you're the first one. You carry that burden, okay? And uh, uh, that would just look at you like, what? What? Uh, let me slap you around a little bit, you know, for making a lot of noise for nothing. You're heartbroken. You've just said something. You know it's beautiful. Inside you, you formed the first story or the second story of your life. And let me tell you that the first story that you ever tell is a poem. <laughs> it comes directly from the unconscious and forms itself. It's not just words that come out, just random words when a poem comes. It comes out in story form. I saw you at the stream and I hated you. Or I saw you at the stream and I loved you. It's not a great story. It's not Dickens. It's a story. Something no other animal had done before. And after four or five or ten times of saying that to mom and pop, go, Jesus. What that animal would feel was an intense loneliness of some kind. That's exactly, this is a little bit of exaggeration, but it's what we feel when, when we try to communicate and we don't get through. Because that communication of that first human child is the same as our communication with others. If we don't get through, we feel isolated. They don't understand us, not in the least. They just walk away from us like we're crazy. <laughs> That's what the animals felt. first human was crazy. It's a crazy animal. It's nuts. They, they didn't have words for it. Something was the matter, you know? What, 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 what the hell is going on? So what we have, whether the first human is a male or it's a female, during that time up to when they began to mate, they would probably be making little stories, not knowing their stories. They had never had an animal existence. All they have is their existence. And out of that existence, somehow, they would pull out of memory things and they would put them together in such a way through gesture and through mind that was a story. And they would tell it to you. You would have the slightest idea what they were talking about. It's a very strange situation. Very strange situation. My whole sense of it is there's an increasing loneliness in the first human animal. You can play with the others. You can have animal talk and stuff like that. But when it really feels good, when those poems are coming up, that moment of ecstasy, that story formation, that 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 divine quality to create a world comes up and nobody gets it. I, it's the same as what poets feel when they talk some, sometimes to people and they do a, a fabulous poem and people look at you. You used to do that at the Barnes and Noble. Some guy might have his finger up his nose and you, don't, you know, come on. It's like you're living in a foreign country sometimes in the United States. It's so it's not a matter of culture. It's a matter of depth. You know, we're a people's heads and hearts, you know. But that's essentially what the first human animal is going to be feeling. Because that same thing that happens in the, to the poet, with that sudden arrival of a story, is formed out, and this time it would be done with sounds and with motions and whatever it happened to be, and screams or cuckoos, whatever. It's going to form a story, and it's heaven blazing into the head, like Yates says. It doesn't have to be... Yeats is wonderful English to produce those effects, I can assure you, you know. Excuse me, a little dry throat here. <coughs> anyway, so we have that situation, and now it, the time comes to mate. So I want to step back from that, because I'm going to come back to it as to what's so important here. And I'm going to make some very fast statements. I'm not going to back them up. You're going to have to live with it. And if you want to learn more... You know the drill. You can read about it in Alice Hickey, and in fact, you can read about it on my other book, which is the um, 
uh, this is some this is some stuff on Julian Jaynes, but over here you'll see that I have another book, which is the Soul Speak: The Outward Journey of the Soul. Gives you a little bit of more insight into Soul Speak as a contemporary form of that first speaking or that first poetry. But you can get them all simply by going to the Soul Speak webpage, or you can go to my page, which branches out into all kinds of things, including the novel Alice Hickey and all its background and its journal notes and everything like that. Okay. We have to ask our question at this stage of the game. Okay, we have our first human. It could be a, a, a boy or a girl. You know, they're going to be equally human. There's no doubt about it. Um, and just to leave that for a second, and then we're going to go and ask ourselves, why then, if the male animal, historically and genetically, has always been stronger, more... You're dominant, did this female goddess come to dominate that early culture? That's the question. Why didn't this guy, why didn't we have male gods in the beginning? What, what happened? What happened in those first humans that made the female so dominant? Yeah, I'll give you another shot of another one from, from another culture. What was it that made them so dominant? That's an interesting question. Because for all intents and purposes, we, we shouldn't have any female gods. If the first human became internalized eventually in terms of myth and song as a god, that's what happens, you know, through stories. <laughs> what else? Okay. And then becomes internalized in a sense that, 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 that it becomes a part of our unconscious. Okay, that animal unconscious started to grow immediately and then become more human. Okay. This is the, they're, they're always interacting, you know. Why do we have female gods? And even more interesting is the question, why is the muse a female? The muse is the goddess who brings your poetry. Why, why, why is that a female? Historically, it has always been, despite the changing of the guard, or the gods, as I like to say, the changing, the changing of the gods. It just stayed female, and nobody argued with that. You know, No one argued with that. I'm going to suggest to you that, that, in fact, the reason that happened, and you can pick up some information on this if you read Alice Hickey, because myself and Alice go into a long, long, long discussion of this, you know, and she was very interested in that issue, too. Why the female, and why so dominant for so many thousands and thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of years? The answer, I think, is in the nurturing. Let's take our first human. Let's say it's a guy. It's a male. It's me. I'm out there. Okay? Not a lot that. No, nobody really gets it. And I go and I mate with another animal. You know, maybe I mate with my mother. You know, go back, you know, and so that the offspring could be, that's a horrible pun, but I kind of like it. The offspring could be either human or it could be another animal. You, you, there's no way you can tell at this early stage where everything's so iffy, you know. But, uh, 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 and then there's another, and then we can mate again at some stage, you know, but, but in fact the male would essentially be a mater, would be better mate, and it has no interest in nurture. In fact, what it likes to do is eat its young once in a while, you know, we can see that throughout, or you beat them up, throw them out, you know, they want to get at the female right away again, and as long as the female is nursing, there's no action. So we see that throughout the primates, and we see it throughout all other animals too, that there's that tendency to just, hey, I want some, let's get rid of the kid, you know. So that's kind of a crass way of putting it, but that's the way it works, you know, in the animal kingdom, there's not a lot of delicacy there. What, what, so what we have is that the male animal isn't really interested in nurturing the humanness or the storytelling, he's just baffled by the storytelling, lonely, doesn't know what to do. He's just procreating and he's leaving 
the babies be, behind, which are either human or animals, and, he, and it goes on and on in the chain. Whereas if we let our first human be a female, that's a female, by the way, if you want to know what the difference is. They look the same, don't they, in this world of unisex. You really can't tell with chimps. It's hard. And maybe it was hard to tell with us, too, before we developed all these primary sexual features that we have, you know. The female human, by the time she reaches mating age, is going to mate with someone. Let's just say that she mates with her father. That's the only guy around, okay? You know, a little simple example, but it could be somebody, maybe it's another animal from some other place, but we don't want to complicate the issue. All we need is a male who's an animal. So the father's there and they, they uh, mate, and what, what, what could come out of it is either a animal or human animal. There's no way to tell at that kind of fragile stage where, where, where it's, where that, human gene, if you want to think of it, or that human characteristic is so suddenly formed, you know, to fabricate things out of memory that, that are your stories in a continuum of time. You know, time was created by stories. Everybody ask a question, what's time? What's time? 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 Uh, to sense time is to be human. You can't be human and not sense time. That sense of time we have is created by the stories we've told since the first human popped into the world. And somehow, all of our stories have beginnings, middles, and ends. That's the way the accident happened. So after a while, since the world is created by stories, the world has a beginning and a middle and an end. And it goes around and around and around. Or if you're of the current thinking, it just goes to the end and there's some big whimper. And bang and it goes out and doesn't make any difference but there's always beginnings and middles and ends it's it's the passage of time that occurs because that's the way that stories occur they begin there's action and they end why why stories are like that we don't know but it has made us into our sense of time <clears throat> More importantly, and I'm going to leave you with this, and I'm just going to play one little short speaking at the end of this, is what happens is that the female mother, who's just as lonely as the male human case I took up for 10 or 12 years or 13 years, has been telling these stories and nobody's listening to her, and that she doesn't know what they mean. She just has to tell them, you know. She kind of feels what they mean. They're, they're like expressions of things that have happened to her and they're how she feels about them. She has a baby. Maybe the baby is an animal. Maybe it's a human. You can't tell at that stage, can you? It's so fragile as to what's going to happen in the genetics. But let's skip past all the times that it was an animal. She'll take care of that baby, naturally. But she will be also what she'll be doing what's natural to her is telling his little stories that she's making up and the animal will look at her like but one day one of the babies is going to look at her like and it's going to imitate her back think how momentous that 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 event is The mother, for the first time, has been able to communicate. And one of her offspring recognizes the story. doesn't have to have any language, it's just animal sounds and just gestures, but it's the, they're kind of strung together. And it gets it. It gets the story. And soon that little child will start to tell stories back, very small stories. And what does the mother do instinctively? The mother instinctively nurtures that humanness, that story making, above everything. That is everything. That's who she is. So if the mother is going to pay any attention to the rearing of her children, which they do extensively, as we know, by seeing how protective they are of their young and all the rest of it, okay? This is something that this mother is going to protect, and she's going to favor those human children. She'll take care of the others 
they're brothers and sisters, but the ones she's going to really take care of are the ones who get it. And she'll be watching to see if they get it. She's telling those little stories, watching the, the age of two or three, the child kind of starts to repeat back. That's how it's done. That's how the nurturing of humanness is done. That's how language is, it evolves, is created, humanness, all our values, everything is done by that. So it's the mother gives us a much better chance. The female gives the human gene or what genome or whatever you want to call it or the structure or whatever it is, that genius that suddenly sprouted, a better chance of surviving because she's, because she's going to protect those humans. And you can imagine the stories that are told afterwards of that first, of that first mother. Not only the stories that the first mother told them, there was nothing and then there was me. And I made you. <laughs> oh, that's a story, isn't it? That's a story. And that internalization of that and how special we were. We were brothers and sisters to the animals, but we were different. We were storytellers, story makers, world creators. Is there any, she's the one who taught us how to tell stories. She's the muse. It eventually evolves into the muse thousands of generations later, you know? But for sure that the seeds are set for the mother, the female, the mother to become a god. The giver of life, the taker of life, instructor of life, everything. The male just got pushed right, the male was like, sorry. Didn't stand a chance. And what she taught them and what they taught their children, the females, and so on down the line, is they taught them to be human, or they encouraged the humanness. They nurtured the humanness, the storytelling, as, as only mothers can do, and they still do it today. You know, they've done studies on kids who are deprived of, of all human contact. It's horrible. They turn into animals, you know. It's just com completely, just bright animals, like, in fact, yeah, we would be, <coughs> without somebody encouraging our humanness. And they know how important it is for the baby to learn language and love and connections and, and, and just storytelling you know, through the mother about those very first attempts but that went on and on. You can see the seeds that are sown are monumental. No time for the male gods. What? Male what? <laughs> male man. Forget it. This is a whole different story. So let me just close off now with, with those things. I want you to think about that too, how monumental those events were. I've kind of put them in that theoretical Einsteinian world where it's very clean. But you can make it as dirty as you want and as complicated as you want. The same thing happens is that the female, the mother, is the one who nurtures humanness. Not just takes the ticks out of you and stuff like that and jams a banana down your mouth, but, it, but, but who tells you stories and waits to see your response and corrects you, you know, whatever, watching you. You can see that first mother becoming the listener too some kind of embodiment of the listener that's going to get internalized that you, your listeners that, that, that anything eventually became the gods and back of the gods you know there's always those uh, the, the, every culture in the Greek culture is the fates nobody knew what they were up to you know just kind of spinning and toiling back there and setting out the things and that's in some sense you can say that was, that's what the listeners were the first glimpse of there's something unknowable that has an interest in us and that's all you can ever say and I think that's all you can ever say period after hundreds of thousands of years that that first glimpse is about the only glimpse that we're going to get and everything else is just a story and some stories are very powerful story of Jesus is powerful story of Buddha is powerful story of Muhammad is and Islam is powerful you know they change countries but they're just stories we shouldn't forget that especially when they wear down and don't have their, their genius in them anymore, which is almost as soon as they're told. I'm, I'm sorry to say they go out of date almost as fast as pocketbooks. Let me just play something for you here. Yeah. Here's one I like very much. It's called House of Women. It's what happens to us when we die. We return to the House of Women. Uh, don't ask me how this poem ever came to me. This is the most mysterious poem I've ever done, but I love it. Mm -hmm. 
Sometimes in my dreams. Sometimes in my dreams. I go to the house of women. You're right beside me. I don't know how I get there. We're walking together. Only that I do it when the door opens. I somehow know where I'm supposed to go. Everyone's there. The women know I'm there, but they don't say anything at all. All the women just walk back and forth on their own. All the men. Small pilgrimages. All the children. Where are they going and where am I going in this house? We're all here. Look for the signs, someone said, and I looked for them, and there they were pointing away. I knew now I was together on the right path. But I didn't know why, only that I that I was, and then the room opened and there it was, right in front of me again. My room. How could it be here or What am I doing here looking at this room where nothing is is mine and yet it feels like my room? All these people in your room. Nothing is mine. Just like mine. Like a, All your a stage set. And your lovers. Wives. I'm going to die here. Children too. I don't know where to go in this house. For you. That room is not... Listen. The room I should go to. It's somewhere else. Just lie down. What can I say about this room? Just lie down. Nothing but memories of you and then... And all this love. You disappearing and then someone else taking your place. Someone else, who is, who is that face and who the is family. that person and why am I even here, still going through your room, look at it, as it always was, They're dark, here in your room. full of small lights and memories of who we are. Look at you. Look at you. Look at me. Look at me. Look at you. Look at me. Look at me. Look at you. Look at you. Look at the love. I could leave this house now. With its tortured vines and rooms that go nowhere. It's so hard. So hard. This is your home. I somehow belong here. The garden with the women and I. The garden of love. Keep being pulled back to something else. The light. This is the road to dying. Right the light of dreams. This is how it looks. This is the door that you come in first. It's the house of the women. The dream and of then dying. you lie down and then you speak to the gods. Just one.